Hello, I see some people are already on the call. We're going to wait a couple minutes till we start. I'm Kevin Carroll, the Executive Director of Tech San Diego. So we'll start just a couple of minutes after 10 to allow enough people to uh, go ahead and jump on. Um, everybody will be in mute um, until our uh, moderator uh, or our person behind the scenes, Sarah, will take people off. You can also ask questions by pushing on the chat button and we'll get to those at the end of, as well. Hope everyone is doing well working remotely. I see our two speakers. Looks like they're working remotely from home. Yes, sir. Did you shut the door so the kids and the dogs don't run in? Uh, I had to bring the dog in. So I'll introduce everybody that's already here. That's Benny. Um, he tends to bark really loudly when uh, he's out in the front room because he dislikes anybody walking in front of our house. So the door is shut, but he's back here with me. He knows we're talking about him, but uh, um, if you see me go on mute randomly, uh, it's because he heard something he does not like. So um, Andrew's uh, gotten to experience that and it's pretty loud. There's so. not a set of key words that we need to be aware of that we can't say like squirrel or cat or anything like that. Are we okay? Uh, I would avoid UPS and FedEx. Those are the, those seem to be the triggers. Okay. Last time with cats. <laughs> How about you, Andrew, you keep the animals out of your room there? Yeah, I have um, actually have them separate. I have one with me and one outside because sometimes they like to fight and create a lot of ruckus. So I separated them, closed the door. So hopefully they're not creating a lot of noise separately. I think one of the things that's going to come out of this, uh, not necessarily this webinar, Ooh. but come out of this crisis is the uh, the really the recognition and the ability to um do more remote meetings and and you know use technology a little better um we'll see what we'll see what happens definitely forced everyone to be remote and learn how to do it remotely i was talking to uh we had a, a podcast with congressman scott peters and we were talking a little bit about how congress is going to start um trying to use um you know technology and and you know there's a lot of um let's say not tech technically uh technically uh proficient uh congressmen in there that are gonna he thought would have a hard time with with some of this so we'll see um we'll see how that goes as well it's 1001 let's wait two more minutes and then we'll go ahead and start sounds good Andrew, I meant to ask, I uh, I switched headsets because everybody complains about my other one. The, the sound on this one's good. Yeah, that one sounds good. Okay. I feel I feel a little more silly having the, uh, the uh, hey, cans whatever on. Works. But, uh, whatever yeah. works. My other headset, apparently the, the microphone's pretty, uh, uh, pretty not good. Yeah, it just cuts in and out a lot, I think, depending on your voice direction or something. This one sounds great though. Cool. I see some folks just jumping on. We're gonna start here in just about a minute. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. For those of you who at least missed my introduction, I'm Kevin Carroll, the Executive Director of Tech San Diego. Uh, proud to present another series of our webinars dealing with the uh, COVID-19. Uh, this one's interesting because there was a lot of information, a ton of information on what was included in the CARES Act 
and and companies jumped on that right away but what we wanted to do is give it a little bit of time and if you notice the title for for this is not what is in the cares act but understanding the cares act and i think there's a big difference in that i think there's some experience behind this uh, about what it did and did not do um, some provisions that people weren't aware of uh, some surprises that popped up so I think uh, this is very timely, especially with uh, refunding uh, some aspect of the CARES Act. So with that said, I'm gonna read a really, really quick bio of our guest today, Kevin Ducey, the tax partner, Moss Adams, and Andrew uh, Yakov, the tax manager, um, representing both sides of the house of Moss Adams. So uh, let me go, Kevin. Kevin is a tax partner with Moss Adams. He has over 15 years of experience in providing tax consulting, and compliance services to public and private companies in the technology, life sciences, manufacturing and distribution industries. He specializes in federal and state tax compliance, international tax consulting, and accounting and consulting for uncertain tax positions. That's interesting. Uh, Kevin's expertise lies with clients multi-state and international operations and has assisted companies with their income tax provision expense computation. Uh, I'm gonna jump to Andrew real quick. Andrew's from the other side of the Moss Adams house. Uh, he's a tax manager at Moss Adams. He has practiced public accounting since 2014. He has vast technical experience in areas um, such as tax preparation, review, and assistance with income tax provisions, tax compliance, and consulting projects for publicly traded and privately held companies, as well as multinational operations. Andrew has assisted clients with projects such as securing uh, workless stock losses, testing debt operating losses under Section 382, and U.S. international tax issues. So between the two of you, you should know everything. So with that, I am going to turn it over. I think I'm going to turn it over first to Kevin, if I'm not mistaken. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, I'll tackle the. Uh, so first, thanks for the uh, thanks for the intros. Um, uh, you know, obviously Andrew and I are very excited to be here. Um, you know, there is a lot about the uh, the CARES Act and and um, you know, I think the main two things we're going to talk about here is, you know, really understanding the business tax provisions. Um, you know, when the CARES Act was passed, it, there were a lot of, of tax nuggets included in there that that really didn't get a lot of attention, but was really focused in on the uh, the loan aspect of it. Um, and so Andrew is going to, you know, walk through a lot of the, the business tax provisions of that, make sure there's a good understanding there, um, hopefully engender some good questions. Uh, from a housekeeping perspective, there is the, you know, both the chat function and the uh, the question function. Um, you know, please feel free to, to, you know, type out questions if you have them. Uh, we will uh, attempt to release all the microphones at, at you know, certain times during the, uh, uh, during the presentation to see if there's any questions. But I will also admit that uh, I am still learning the ropes on, uh, you know, working remote, doing a lot of webcasts. So, um, bear with us if if technology is not on our side. We do have again um, the ability to type stuff out to uh, to get the questions out. Um, the other side we want to talk about is you know to cover some of the financial planning stuff, including the loans. Um, when we first started uh, getting ready for this, we thought you know we were honestly a little concerned that things were going to be dated. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see why. Is you know the CARES Act was passed you know, a month and a day ago. Um, and while, you know, one side that doesn't seem like very long, but in today's business environment, that's, you know, it, that also feels like it's been forever. Um, and so we were worried that a lot of the information was gonna be stale, that, that you know, from a loan perspective, not as exciting, um, but as, you know, Kevin Carroll alluded to, um, as of yesterday, we've got a, a whole lot more funding um, by that last bullet, the PPP. Technically, I think it's called the PPP and Healthcare Enhancement Act. Um, I just refer to it as the PPP Enhancement Act because it's easier to say. Um, but uh, you know, again, you know, this thing's been out for a little bit over a month. We've got some brand new funding, so we will touch on a little bit of the loan stuff. Um, and again, I think one of the big things to consider with the CARES Act that that Andrew's going to focus on is um, it wasn't a tax bill, but there's a lot of good tax stuff in there that that can mean cash flow to to local businesses. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to uh, to Andrew and let him get rolling and put myself on mute. Thanks, Kevin. Well, uh, thanks everyone for joining. I appreciate everyone taking the time to uh, stay with us this morning and learn more about the CARES Act provisions. First, we're gonna to touch on the payroll tax provisions, but before I get a deeper dive into those payroll tax provisions, I just wanna take a step back and you know, 
share with everyone what the intent behind all of these provisions were. You know, obviously it's cash flow driven to get cash in people's pockets, but the underlying reason behind getting everyone cash so quickly is to, you know, keep people employed, make it cheaper to pay your employees, make it cheaper to temp people with you on payroll. Uh, if you are a business owner and, you know, these are provisions that are intended to help, you know, facilitate that. So when you think about, you know, if you're eligible for these payroll tax provisions, uh, keep that in mind and, uh, you know, understand that the goal behind these is to really help keep your people employed. All right, so one of the mechanisms to help facilitate that is an employee retention credit. And this is a credit that is available on uh, for employees that are affected in some aspect by COVID-19 and for businesses that are affected by COVID-19. The, the way the computation works is it's up to 50% of your eligible wages, up to $10,000 per, per employee. So that comes down to a $5,000 credit per employee. And it considers wages from March 13th, 2020 through year end. And it's on your employer's portion of your social security taxes. And to the extent that, you know, the credit offsets your FICA taxes, there's potentially some amount that is refundable. So again, think about the goal of it is to get cash in your pocket, make it cheaper to keep your employees. And this credit is permanent. So to the extent you're able to benefit from the credit, uh, this is a permanent, you know, exclusion of those FICA taxes, employer portion of FICA taxes. So again, you know, the goal of keeping people employed, making it cheaper to keep people employed and getting the cash to in people's pockets to the extent it's refundable. Uh, to the extent you're a business with greater than employ 100 employees, you have to look at only to the wages paid that are not providing services, you know, due to COVID-19 type impacts. Uh, you know, there's a new part-time provision that's supposed to come out. Uh, to the extent you're less than 100 employees, you know, all of the wages for employees are eligible without having to look at this nuance based on uh, impacted COVID-19 employees. Uh, to be eligible for the credit, there's, you know, you have to fit one of two criteria. One is more black and white. One of them I feel like is more gray. The first one is the gray one. And, you know, operations are were fully or partially suspended based on orders from a governmental authority due to some COVID-19, uh, you know, shutdown, uh, like stay at home orders for us in California. Uh, you know, this is obviously very black and white for a brick and mortar type store, like a gym. You know, if you're operating a gym and you have to close down, obviously you are fully or partially suspended from COVID-19 and would be eligible for the credit. Now, uh, you know, what's more gray is, let's say you're more indirectly affected. You're a more online business. You're still able to operate, but maybe your sales are lower. You know, does that count as a partial shutdown for purposes of being eligible for this credit? Uh, there's not a lot of guidance out there as far as what that means. The IRS has issued some FAQs on some examples, but the FAQs were more covering on the black and white type scenarios, which is, you know, very obvious. We already knew if it's fully or partially suspended if you're closing down your brick and mortar store. But for, a, you know, an online business, how, what does that mean? And there's there's a lot of gray and there's guidance coming out and it's very fluid. So, you know, what what's out there right now may not be necessarily what you should be able to rely on. You could potentially take some more aggressive positions to say that you're partially, fully or partially suspended, depending on your fact pattern. And maybe you don't know yet because you haven't looked at the numbers and haven't been able to run a scenario to see how much you are affected by COVID-19. The other one is more black and white. And this is if you experience a 50% reduction in gross receipts uh, for a calendar year as compared to the same calendar quarter in the prior year. So it's a gross receipts test, very mechanical, very obvious if you qualify for this gross receipts type test because it's mechanical. You can you can calculate, you can take comfort in knowing that you're eligible based on the mechanical test of, you know, if your gross receipts are lower compared to last year's same quarter. Uh, one thing to note that, you know, if you're taking the employee retention credit, you, uh, for the same wages that are forgivable under the PPP loan, you know, you're not able to also take credit on those same wages. So something to keep in mind that if you're going for the PPP loan, you're not uh, able to take this credit if you're unsure if you're, you know, again, going to be forgiven for the PPP loan, you are able to take the credit until you for sure know that you're forgivable under the PPP loan. So there was some guidance that was favorable that said, if you don't know if you're going to be able to get the credit and you're not able to know if you're going to get a forgivable PPP loan, you know, you can do the credit until then if you are eligible under the credit. Okay, so jumping along, the next aspect okay, of... Just 
Yeah. Really quick, Andrew. One, one, um, because again, to, to Kevin's point, I think we've got some experience since uh, um, kind of this first launched. One question that we are um, seeing a lot of is for um, businesses that have multiple locations, you know, part of that gray area, that, that partial shutdown. Um, a question that I've gotten a few times is, you know, for like doctor's office, vet's offices, things like that, where some locations are shut down, some are still open. Um, it's important to look at for purposes of the, of the retention credit, it's the business as a whole. So you could have, you know, multiple locations and one is still, you know, 100% open, firing on all cylinders. Um, and so there is no reduction there, but it looks as the business overall. And so the wages that are being paid to the people that are still, you know, that are that are in the location that's that's fully functional, fully operational, would still be eligible for the credit. So there, um, you know, there is some that's consideration there. Elements of the loans, um, you know, if we have time, we'll get into later. Breaks it down location by location. This almost goes the exact opposite and says, no, you look at the business as a whole, um, as opposed to getting to the granular uh, location level. So, just food for Thanks, thought. Kevin. Yeah, I know that that's a good one because I know the PPP loan had provisions for, you know, certain industries being able to break it down by store. Right. So the next aspect, so in conjunction with the employee retention credit, you're also able to defer the remaining amount of your employer portion of your Social Security taxes. So uh, this is kind of a, you know, uh, peanut butter and the jelly, you know, these things go together. There's the employer retention credit and there's the deferral of the remaining taxes that you're not able to credit on the employer portion of Social Security. So it's essentially an interest-free loan on your you know, employer portion of Social Security taxes that aren't credit creditable and you're able to pay that 50% at the end of 2021 and the remaining 50% in a 2022. Uh, so you can see how you know coming back to the intent the intent is to make it cheaper to pay your employees. So in conjunction with having this credit to permanently disallow some of the taxes you have to pay on paying those employees, you're able to defer the remaining amount. Uh, you know, one nuance with that is, you know, switching gears and thinking about it from an income tax perspective, if you're not paying and you're accruing a social security tax on your financial statements, for example, you know, you wouldn't be able to deduct that social, you know, accrued social security tax. So then you have an income tax reduction in benefit because you're not able to deduct that until paid in 2021, 2022. So there's some potential modeling as far as, you know, would you rather, re you know, reduce income taxes this year or are you able to better benefit from having this interest-free loan? Uh, it really depends and just something to consider if you are being, uh, considering the payroll tax deferral. And again, you know, Keep in mind, you're, you cannot defer the payment if you receive the PPP loan, but until you know that the PPP loan is forgivable, you can defer the payment. So which is some uh, nice favorable news that came out recently. Andrew, one question to, yeah. that, uh, just really quick, one question that, that um, popped up was, uh, so I'm, I'm monitoring the questions as we go. Um, one uh, question was what, you know, whether or not there's gonna be um, a recording available. I believe this is being recorded and will be available um, on the uh, on the website, but also um, Andrew and I are going to make all the slides available. Um, so you will be able to, to access that. Um, another question that specific to what you were just talking about was, and Kevin gave me the thumbs up, so um, confirmed. Um, and then is the, reten the que question that popped up was, is the retention credit available to sole proprietors? And I believe this is, um, talking about more the, the self-employed aspect of it. And my understanding is it is available to self-employed individuals. Uh, so you'd have to work with your payroll provider. I know some payroll providers are more uh, helpful than others. Some will require you to make the calculation of the creditable wages yourself and provide it to your payroll provider. And then they'll you know input that information into the form. It's a form 7200 that you file with your payroll tax filing. And uh, you know that, reduces your uh, payrolls, employer portion of your social security taxes via that form 7200 filing. You know, other payroll providers will be more friendly and help you out as far as helping you figure out what's a qualified wage, if you're eligible, those kind of things. You know, obviously, uh, you know, there's some risk there in that, you know, you calculating it yourself, you may not be familiar, as familiar with the rules, but hopefully your payroll provider is able to provide you some guidance as far as helping you determine what the eligible wages would be. 
Yeah, and I think the other side of that is the um, to a sole proprietor that's not paying wages on the self-employed um, tax side. That's where I think we we have a different answer. I think the answer on that is that the the SE tax side um, is not creditable. Um, but again, I'll I'll confirm that. But um, Andrew, is that consistent with your yeah, understanding? Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a good distinction. So think about your employees, right? You know, to the extent you're able to keep your employees, I think that's the you know, thinking back to the intent. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, there was um, also one more that popped up as we were answering that was, uh, you know, someone indicated, you know, they have some specific questions related to independent uh, consultants, independent contractors, um, and just a comment that, um, not sure if this is the right forum. The, you know, we had our contact information on the first slide. We duplicate that at the end. Um, you know, if there are questions that you feel are maybe a little nuanced or, or warrant more of a um, in-depth discussion, uh, you know, please reach out to Andrew and I. Um, you know, we, we're you know we're happy to to I'd say give us give us a day or two to respond just because you know working remote and, and trying to keep everything balanced. Uh, email is not as easy as it is when we're sitting in the office, but um, but please reach out, let us know if there are questions that are a little more nuanced um, that we can answer. So, and yeah, again, I'll step you. back and, and let Andrew keep going. And now we're gonna switch gears into the income tax provisions. So the, you know, the first couple of slides we're talking to the payroll tax provisions to help make your employees, you know, uh, keep your employees, make, them, make it cheaper to keep them. Uh, income tax side, so that's this is back to the goal of getting cash into everyone's hands. So there's some, in conjunction with, you know, some of the other favorable provisions is these cash provisions. So the first one was the net operating loss modification. I know it says for corporations, but this modification was for all taxpayers, you know, individuals and corporations. And the to understand what the changes, you have to understand what the original rule was. And the original rule was as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which was enacted in of 2017. You know, the, the ability to carry back NOLs was removed. So that means the NOLs can only be carried forward from 2018 and forward. Um, you know, as part of the CARES Act, they removed that limitation on being able to carry back your net operating losses. And now you're able to carry them back up to five years. So this means if you had a net, net operating loss in 2018 through 2020, you're able to carry that back potentially to 2013 through uh, 2018, depending on you know, income in those years and, uh, you know, your fact pattern as far as when the loss was generated and if you had income in a subsequent year. Uh, you know, there's an additional benefit in that, let's say you're a C corporation, if you're carrying a net operating loss forward, that would benefit you at a 21% tax rate because the, the tax rate currently is 21%. Whereas if you're able to carry it back, you're able to offset taxable income that was potentially taxed as high as 35%. So there's potentially a rate arbitrage permanent benefit on those net operating losses that you wouldn't have done under the old uh, the old law prior to the CARES Act. So it's very, very favorable. This is the ability to carry back net operating losses and get cash in your pocket immediately. There's a, a couple of different mechanisms of being able to uh, get that cash. And there's a form 1139 if you're a C corporation and a form, I believe it's 1045 if you're an individual, 1044, I might've messed that up, Kevin. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> 1045, you are, 1045. you are. Thank you. And what that is, is a tentative refund claim. And the due date for that tentative refund claim is uh, the end of this year, if you have a loss that's generated in 2019 or 2018, if, sorry, let me take that back. If you have a loss in 2019, the due date to file that form is at the end of 2020. If you have a 2018 loss you want to carry back, the due date for that is June 30. So there's you know, a limited window to act on that tentative carry back refund form if you have a 2018 net operating loss. Um, you know, the reason for that is the original due date for a 2018 tentative refund claim would have been the end of 2019, which is already passed. You know, IRS uh, understood that and enacted a, a favorable extension of being able to file that tentative refund through June 30, because obviously, you know, you weren't able to carry back a loss prior, so there wasn't a need to have this extension. Uh, so there's some, you know, the, the benefit behind doing a tender refund claim is the uh, the speed in, in which the IRS returns your refund to you without a review. So they do a, perform a limited review, you know, they test some very limited things, and then they give you back your cash uh, fairly quickly. Whereas the alternative is, let's say you missed the due date, you know, you're not stuck and not being able to carry it back, but then you have to file an amended return 
which has a much longer process processing time than the tentative refund claims do. So there is some benefit in being able to act on that June 30 deadline, especially if you have 2018 net operating loss you want to carry back. Uh, the, you know, the alternative is still there. You can still file an amended return, just longer processing time. The RS also came out with some recent uh, guidance saying that you can fax the tentative refund claims because all the IRS offices are closed, so obviously they're not able to process it. You know, the procedure prior to this faxing uh, instructions is that you have to paper file those tentative refund claims. So obviously faxing is much faster. That faxing was available as of April 17th, so something fairly recent that the IRS issued out saying, you know, if you've already filed a paper one, you can still fax it, which was pretty nice, and faxing it will obviously allow you to get that cash faster. And, you know, the second one is, is the second modification in operating rules is specific to C corporations in that uh, prior to Tax Cuts and Jobs Act being enacted, so for 2017 and prior, you're able to utilize 100% of net operating loss losses against your taxable income. After the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was enacted, you're now only able to offset 80% of your taxable income with net operating losses. The CARES Act removed that limitation and you're now able to use 100% of your net operating loss against taxable income. So let's say you're not able to carry back those losses, but instead you have to carry them forward. You know, under the current or under the old regime, you would have to potentially pay a little bit of tax on 20% of your taxable income because your net operating losses weren't able to upset 100% of it. Now that's gone, which is uh, fairly favorable and should get you more cash in your pocket, which is the ultimate goal. All right, so this is touching on, again, the increased benefit in being able to carry it back. You know, to the extent possible, you should carry it back because of the higher rate in a prior year. Yeah, one thing, um, yeah. just again, kind of, you know, now that we've we've had a chance to look at this and uh, with a little bit of experience, one thing that Andrew and I have run into um, is, you know, if if you were party to a transaction, um, meaning that, that um, you know, there was either a... Uh, um, Either you bought somebody or you have new ownership or um, whatever. There's normally some very some very specific language in there as far as if there's refunds that go back um, prior to the ownership change, um, who actually gets that. So just make sure you're you're looking at that. Because again, the the whole um, the whole point here is is these are all cash flow plays to get more money into the company's pockets. Um, as Andrew hit on, you know, some of them. Um, intended to get stuff back really, really quick via the the tentative refund claims. Um, you know, timeline on those is normally you know 90 days, 120 days versus um, a, a traditional amended return can take as long as a year. Um, so very much wanting to accelerate. But what um, what we've run into is on a couple of them where we feel there's opportunities for our clients. Looking at um, you know carrying back now, we're looking at at you know taking it back four or five years there were different owners and having to then go through and find out who actually has rights to that cash. The last thing we want to do is carry back a loss um, and then have that not be the company's money due to due to wording in the agreement. So um, if that is your fact pattern, just be aware, um, you know, that's where you talk to legal and just say, hey, if we carry this back, who gets it? Um, and just make sure that they're on, uh, on the same page. Yeah, that's a good point. I have a few clients we're working with you know, buyer's counsel to help see, you know, what opportunities the client has to be able to keep the cash because we're carrying back a loss that's economically the buyer's loss because it was post acquisition of the company, but we're carrying back the loss to a year or we want to carry back the loss to a year anyway. That was part of the sellers and when the sellers held the company. So now you have a situation where you have to look to the agreement to see, you know, what uh, carve outs there are in there to be able to use it you know economically it's obviously the the company's loss you know post acquisition but now you're carrying it back to tax that the seller paid so how does that you know you have to kind of work through those things and usually it's some some discussion with the seller and the buyer's counsel as far as what opportunities there are to carry that back so going to the you know there's some other kind of nuanced things you know let's say you're carrying back a loss and you had a DPAT deduction in the year of the loss or the income that you're carrying back to. So you're carrying back a 2018 NOL to a 2013 year, but you had a DPAT deduction in 2013 tax year. What DPAT was, was a 9%, you know, 
phantom deduction on your taxable income to the extent you're a domestic manufacturer. So this was an incentive to, you know, incentivize companies to domestic manufacture uh, in the U.S. And, you know, the if you carry back income or loss to that income year, you no longer have income. So that, you know, that phantom DPAT deduction is no longer available because it's a phantom deduction, 9% of your taxable income. So you have some potential for a reduced benefit to carrying it back. And it does require some modeling and there's some other type of income tax provisions. That was just one example that are based on a percent of percentage of your taxable income to where you know carrying back the NOL may not be as advantageous as carrying it forward, depending on you know those various kind of mechanical operations of how the net operating loss would impact other income tax deductions and provisions in your you know prior periods. So there's some modeling to be done to kind of determine what that impact would be. You know, one other favorable thing that was kind of enacted as part of the CARES Act, when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was enacted at the end of 2017, there was a drafting error in the uh, the ability to carry back under the old rules for fiscal year taxpayer. So if you're a fiscal year taxpayer, meaning your year end is not December 31, you know, if you had a tax year that began in 2017 and ended in 2018, there was a technical glitch in how the original drafting, original wording was drafted that didn't allow those taxpayers to carry back the losses under the old rules, which was two two year carry back period. So which is this was unfortunate for a lot of those fiscal year taxpayers that were stuck, unable to carry back this loss, even though, you know, prior to the uh, enactment of Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, they would have been able to carry back that loss. So this the CARES Act fixed that technical glitch. If you have a calendar year end, you don't have to worry about this. And this was something specific to uh, C corporations mostly, to my understanding. So ex excess business loss rules. So part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and this is specific to individual taxpayers, uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act had this idea of, you know, there was many other limitations as far as being able to utilize the losses. There's basis, there's at-risk rules. Uh, you know, the EBL rules or excess business loss rules were like another waterfall that a taxpayer had to, uh, you know, jump through to be able to deduct a loss on their individual tax return. You know, what's favorable is that the, uh, you know, the CARES Act removed this limitation for 2018, 2019, 2020. You know, what's interesting is that if you had this limitation apply, you'd probably be aware because your tax repair told you you're not able to use 100% of your loss in one of your tax years, so specifically 2018. Now that 2018 is probably filed, potentially 2019 if you filed prior to the CARES Act. So there's some opportunity to potentially amend and be able to use 100% of those losses in those periods. So something favorable. Uh, you know, the, the rules are just a temporary suspension. A lot of these things are temporary suspension of the rules just to allow immediate cash flow of taxpayers. And a lot of them are going to be reenacted for 21, 2021 and forward. Uh, you know, so what is taking a step back? What do all these things mean? You know, it's really a matter of getting cash in everyone's hands via net operating loss carrybacks. Uh, for if you're a corporate taxpayer, I think we're going to touch on a little bit later. If you have AMT tax credit carried forward, you're able to get 100% of that refunded if you have a carry forward. Uh, the technical amendments in the statute, so let's say if you're a fiscal taxpayer, you know, all these things are really trying to correct items that were, should have been corrected originally when the original drafting Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and to, you know, alleviate the tax burden for taxpayers uh, for 2018 through 2020 tax years. Uh, so, you know, we're thinking 2020, you know, 2020, we're in 2020 right now, right? But we're, you know, taxpayers or tax preparers, we live in the past. So we're preparing 2019 tax returns still. So, you know, there's still time to act. So don't feel like you already missed the ball. There's still time to act on these 2020 planning and uh, take advantage of these cash provisions. Uh, so one last big item that I'm going to talk about before getting into back to Kevin on the PPP loans is qualified improvement property. So, you know, again, another technical glitch as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was, you know, previously leasehold improvements, if you're the taxpayer that, you know, improved the property, the leasehold, you're usually able to, to deduct 100% of those leaseholds, or at least that was the intent behind the drafting of the legislation. But there was a glitch in the legislation drafting that pretty much kicked out any leasehold improvements, uh, specifically qualified improvement property and that's the technical term definition and uh, you know all this is doing is now it corrected that technical glitch so in your 2018 tax return that you already filed you know you potentially 
uh, you know, are depreciating that qualified improvement property over 39 years, but now under the CARES Act, that is eligible for bonus depreciation and bonus depreciation being 100% write off of that property. Uh, so there's some there's some ability to amend your refund all or amend your 2018 return to get a refund for claiming bonus on that property. And let's say you elected out of bonus, there's some guidance out there now that says you can cancel that election, which is fairly favorable. And it doesn't even have to be on that qualified improvement property. Let's say you elected out of bonus for all of your property and you could potentially revoke a bonus election for other property too. So there's some planning opportunities there for a 2018 tax return year. Uh, you know, let's say you don't want to go back and amend 2018. There's actually a uh, form 3115 you can file that will allow you to claim the missed bonus depreciation in your 2019 tax year. So why would you want to do that? You know, for, there's a couple of reasons why you want, might want to do that. You don't want to amend 2018 return, or let's say you're in 2019, you're already in a substantial loss position, which, you know, doesn't sound like a good position to be in right now, but to the extent you can increase deductions in 2019, you know, maybe now you have a larger loss that you can then carry back. Whereas if you amended 2018 and took that deduction, you know, you're still in the income position in 2018, maybe to where, you know, that deduction is worth to you, you know, if you're a C corporation, 21 cents of the dollar. But if you take it in 2019, now you have a larger net operating loss that's worth 34 cents on the dollar. So now you have a rate arbitrage that you can potentially benefit from on when you're taking these deductions. So there's definitely some planning to do and helping to determine when to take the deduction can be very important. Uh, so work with your tax people, you know, we're happy to help too if you have questions, but you know, th there's definitely some modeling to be done as far as net operating loss carrybacks and this qualified improvement property and how you want to approach it for 2018 or 2019 tax returns. Uh, one of the other modifications, this is slightly nuanced, is just a uh, computational aspect of your taxable income. You know, previously from 2018 forward, interest expense was limited to 30% of a tax EBITDA, so earnings before interest, depreciation, amortization, and taxes. Uh, you know, that Congress increased the base and now you're able to deduct up to 50% of your interest expense of your tax EBITDA versus 30% of your tax EBITDA. Uh, so something to keep in mind, and it's, it's something that's applicable for 2019 and forward, so you don't have to amend 2018 for this, which is nice because a lot of people haven't prepared their 2019 tax returns, so there's still time to implement this provision. So for partnership impacts, so there's some weird nuanced rules for partnerships. So if you have a, you know, you're a business and you're operating as a partnership, and you must continue to use 30% for 2019, but you know, an individual is able to use the 50% on their personal return. And there's some weird kind of nuances there. So, uh, you know, there's something specific to partnerships. So if you don't have a partnership, you don't necessarily have to worry about it, but some nuance in the computation for, you know, how you calculate on your business return versus how it's calculated on your individual return. So they're still able to get some benefit, but not as beneficial as if you're a individual or C corporation taxpayer subject to the limitation rules. Uh, corporate AMT, so this is what I was speaking to previously. If you're, this is specific to C corporation taxpayers. Uh, you know, as part of Tax Cuts and Jobs Act enacted at the end of 17, it removed corporate AMT entirely. So why are we still talking about it? Because if you paid corporate AMT, you had a corporate AMT tax credit. And the way the, the mechanism of getting that cash back to you to the extent you paid corporate AMT is through a, you know, you're able to offset your regular tax you know, going forward, 2018 forward for the AMT that you paid previously. But to the extent you don't have tax, you have this credit that you're carrying forward. And there was a 50% kind of de de declining balance every year they're able to refund of that corporate AMT balance. Congress made us that way you can immediately refund that corporate AMT that you had. Uh, then that's through the 1139 filing. What's interesting to note is if you have a corporate AMT refund, the due date for that is June 30. If you are also carrying back a 2018 net operating loss. So if you're in a C corporation with the position of having a 2018 net operating loss and a corporate AMT carry back, you have to file both of those by June 30 of this year. And now I'm going to leave it off to Kevin to talk about the planning and other thoughts, mostly specific to the PPP loan. All right, just one quick uh, 
make sure I'm not muted on that. Um, just one quick comment on, on Andrew. I mean, obviously, it's it, there's a lot of technical nuances there. Um, you know, if there's one thing that that he stressed a couple of times that I would I would add a little more stress to as well. It's most of this is a modeling exercise, and it's it's math. And um, the good news is your tax guys love math. That's that's what we do. Um, so you don't necessarily have to do it, but um, just understand that because there's a, a lot of different rules and there's there's different years. And um, you know, Andrew mentioned rate arbitrage a couple of times. That um, this is all designed to get you uh, to get cash back to businesses um, and to do it in as streamlined of a way as possible. But it does require um, you know essentially some modeling out to find out what is the most advantageous way to do it. Because to Andrew's point, simply um, you know, taking the deduction at the earliest possible time, that's from a tax perspective, that's normally the no brainer, like, yeah, you get a deduction, let's take it as early as possible, um, may not be the right answer. Um, so just be aware that, that nobody likes to hear from the tax people like, hey, you know, we need to model that out because it's just like, well, no, I just, I want the answer, I want my refund. Um, but be aware there's a lot of interplay um, and a lot of um, stuff that, that you want to work with your tax guys on uh, to get there. So now that that plugs out of the way, um, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of the loan stuff. Like, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, this was the part I was concerned about for this presentation was that up until, um, you know, kind of the tail end of last week, it was, okay, is anything going to get passed or am I going to be presenting on stuff that's that's old and stale and, and isn't available? Um, the first round of funding, we all know it went quick. Some of, hopefully some of you on the call um, succeeded in securing a loan. I've got a handful of clients that, that were successful. Um, more often, what we heard was that by the time their loan got processed, all the funds were gone. Um, because there's a lot of headaches around the SBA website, trying to get you know their lenders having the applications available, things crashing, all of that. So um, you know, as of yesterday, new funding is available. It's it's the the PPP Enhancement Act, I believe, um, was a total of 484 billion, um, and that's uh, both for um, some very targeted uh, support, but also for loan. Um, for loan stuff. So you'll see on here, most of this relates to the original and I just put kind of updates um, here, uh, but that's what I'm really gonna focus on is the update chunk of it. Uh, I'm sure most people have been blasted about um, the various uh, the various loan options. So I'll talk a little bit about them, but mostly focused on the updates. So uh, you gotta go back, man. Um, uh, go back one more. There we go. All right. Again, technology, we're getting used to it. Andrew's driving, uh, so apologies if he's driving us uh, off the cliff. Um, but so the EIDLs, the, the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, these have been around for a while. Um, I'll refer to it as an EIDL, um, just the acronym EIDL. Um, these are something that, that traditionally were more for kind of what we're used to seeing from like an act of God, like a, a tornado, an earthquake, um, you know, fires, floods. Um, things like that, uh, as part of the CARES Act, was expanded to include the COVID-19 impacts. These are typically smaller than um, what I'll refer to as the, the SBA loan or the 7A loan, um, and that they're capped at $2 million. bucks. There isn't a loan forgiveness aspect of them, so they're less exciting. Um, but what, um, what really is good news related to these is up to a 30-year term, interest rates are, are relatively favorable um, and they don't necessarily have to be used for um, you know the same things that a 7a loan would be um, what you do have to be able to do is make a good faith certification that the amounts you're getting the loan for are because due to um, COVID-19 you're not able to make these payments so it's not meant as a replacement for lost revenue but really because from a cash flow perspective, you're, it's a disaster and you're not able to, to, um, to meet certain expenses. So um, these you don't need, uh, you don't need to walk into a bank at the bottom left of this slide is, is the website where you can apply. Um, the update on this was an additional 50 million of that 484, an additional 50 million, or sorry, I think that should be 50 billion. 
um, was earmarked for um, the idols. So some additional uh, stuff specific to these. So um, that's the update on that. Andrew, if you can skip to the next one. Again, I keep saying million, but I believe that's actually should be a B. Um, but uh, you know, the idle advanced loans, these are um, essentially, if done properly, $10,000 grants. Um, they are, this is funds that are supposed to be immediately available um, and immediate means within three days of a successful application. Uh, their advance is up to 10,000 bucks and the advance doesn't have to be repaid. If you hear whining, that's my dog in the background. Um, just so you know, it's not my stomach. Um, but uh, so these are, you know, once you have the application done um, and you meet eligibility requirements, these are advances of 10,000 bucks that do not have to be repaid. And again, um, it's the same website down at the bottom left. And the update on here is just simply more funding. And Andrew, to the next one. Um, so the bridge loans, so this is, uh, you know, essentially a way to access smaller amounts of money, uh, quote unquote, faster. Um, I put that in, in kind of the, the air quotes because um, it requires an SBA express lender, which means going into your traditional um, financial institution, your existing banking relationship and going through the process. From what I'm being told bandwidth wise, all the banks are focused on the 7A loans, the big ones. Um, and so they're not going to be as excited about this, um, this bridge loan, um, but they are the ones that you have to go through to get it. So um, what the bridge loan is, 25,000 um, bucks, it's meant to uh, basically bridge the gap between today and um, when you get an idle and when it funds. Um, and the 25,000 bucks, if you get an idle, um, has to be repaid by those funds. So they just roll it into the loan. Um, again, the main thing on here, no updates via um, the Enhancement Act, um, but the main thing here is it needs to be through an SBA Express lender, which means uh, working with your existing um, banking relationship. So to the next one and the fun one. Um, and now Benny is really excited. Um, so this is the, uh, what everybody's really, really excited about. And that's the, uh, the Paycheck Protection Loan, the PPP loan. Um, this was the big chunk of the CARES Act that, that got people excited. I'm flipping in my notes. Um, main thing here was this money ran out really, really quick. And so um, that was the biggest complaint. They had people that were um, taking advantage of it via some of the nuances. People were getting more, or companies were getting more than $10 million worth of loans. Um, companies that in theory didn't necessarily need it. And so a lot of negative press about this. And so they tightened up some things as a result. Um, you know, the biggest update obviously is the additional funding, 310 billion um, strictly for um, the 7A loans. Um, you know, it's a, there's a small business element, 500 or less employees. There's some carve outs for physicians practices. There's some carve outs for um, hospitality and food industry. This one's, you know, they're, they're, they're tightening down. Um, cause this was one of the complaints was that some of the larger like restaurant chains, things like that were getting, um, more than 10 million worth of loans because, uh, that, that fourth bullet on the eligibility is, um, they allowed you to look store by store. And we alluded to that earlier in, in some of the discussion on Andrew's chunk. Um, so, you know, there, there is an ability to do that. And then there's also some carve outs for franchises as far as how those are looked at, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else on this slide. Again, I'm I'm really glossing over it one for time too because these are you know the people have been been probably beat up about these already. Um, if we can go to the next one, talk a little bit about the debt forgiveness. Um, this is why these are so exciting. Uh, is that there's one there's an element of um, debt forgiveness which is huge. You know you get get a big loan, don't have to repay it. That's that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, the other side of that is typically when that happens from a tax perspective, that's a taxable event. Um, the IRS has said, you know what, we're, we're not gonna tax that. That's not only are you not gonna have to pay it back, but it's also gonna be excludable from taxable income, which is a, a big deal. Um, one caveat to that, one thing you wanna be aware of is that's for the IRS. Um, 
state of California is notorious for not necessarily um, following suit. So um, I think it's still too new and, and I haven't seen anything as far as whether or not California is going to conform. But um, generally speaking, there's a little bit of a lag time where California decides whether or not they're going to agree to that. So um, just be aware. Uh, there are certain things that you have to use the loans for um, in order to get the debt forgiveness. There's four buckets here, payroll costs, interest on mortgages, rents, and utilities. 75% of it has to be on payroll. Um, as Andrew indicated on his, everything about the CARES Act has to do with employment. Um, it's really, it's keeping people um, either employed or busy or paid um, really is, is the key of it. So, so in order to qualify for the, the forgiveness chunk, 75% has to be on payroll. If it's less than that, you're gonna have a prorated forgiveness amount. Um, and I guess just from a nuanced perspective, it's the, the covered period is its expenses within the eight week period from whenever the loan funds, the, the origination date. Um, one important thing that um, it's not, uh, I don't think it's codified anywhere. I don't think it's part of the actual act, but one thing that, that uh, Mnuchin said was that all loans 2 million and greater are going to be subject to audit. Um, I think the, the actual way that it was phrased was that they were going to audit all loans over that dollar amount, but um, from a practicality standpoint, who knows, but just be aware that, that um, you know, this requires some certifications. Um, the bank is the one that's supposed to work with you on um, whether or not you qualify for forgiveness, but be aware that, um, that there is an audit element of this, that the, the uh, you know, the government is going to come in and make sure that you meet all the requirements. So, and to the next slide. Um, yeah, this is, so again, it's, it's based on keeping people on the payroll and keeping them paid, um, you know, for that loan forgiveness, if you're, if you don't have the same headcount or you're not paying them, um, at least 75% of what you're paying them before, um, during that covered period, then they're going to prorate the amount of loan that, that gets forgiven. Um, and the, uh, um, the last point is, you know, we get a lot of questions about this. I'd say since CARES Act passed last month, the number one question I've gotten has been all around the SBA stuff. And I'm, you know, I'm not a banker and I'm an, I'm an accountant. Um, we try our best to answer, but but keep in mind that this has to go through a um, an SBA lender. Um, and, you know, essentially, you know, they're, they've got some requirements as far as how fast they're, they're required to respond, all of that. Um, but again, what I'm hearing is that you, if you've got an existing banking relationship, work through that. Banks have to go through a, a know your customer um, requirement for all the SBA processes, and they don't necessarily have the bandwidth to bring on new folks. So, um, you know, hopefully you've got an existing banking relationship you can leverage because um, that's where they're going to focus first. Okay. This slide, I won't walk through it, but. Um, you know, when we do circulate the slides, this is just a great um, reference to compare the idle and the and the seven A loans. Um, the only uh, the only change to this, I think that that Andrew, please make a note so we can update it, is that bottom right um, criteria for the idle of um, loans aren't meant to replace lost profits, and that you have to be able to to certify, make a good good pay certification that it's a working capital need. That is now the case for seven A loans as well. Uh, it didn't used to be, but as part of the new tranche, that's one of the nuances, is now it's required to um, to cover that. So um, let's see. So the final few slides, I'm really going to gonna shotgun through these to, to hopefully try to you know, leave at least a couple of minutes in case there's questions. Um, but as part of this, again, you know, all of the, the stuff related to COVID-19 related to the tax stuff, Andrew's talking about the loans, it's all cash flow stuff. Um, and so, you know, some of this may seem like common sense, um, you know, but one thing that I would, I would say is, you know, all the things like what we've listed here, cash flow budgets, financial projections, um, head counts, uh, you know, talking to landlords, all of that. These used to be a good idea to do quarterly or to do, you know, semi-annually, you know, now it's in some cases, you know, we talk about weekly cash flow budgets. Um, it really is, uh, you know, a, a requirement to get in there and um, 
and look at this on a much higher cadence. So um, if you've got a process in place, great. Um, if you're doing it every month, that's probably not fast enough anymore. So um, all of these things start under, you know, start undergoing a, a much more strict process to, to be looking at these consistently or constantly. Um, next slide. Um, you know, if you've got an e-commerce, if, you, if you're a mixture of brick and mortar and, um, and online, um, you know, and you're sitting on inventory, again, from a cash flow perspective, that's bad. Um, you know, if you're sitting on inventory and you do have the ability to sell online, consider discounting. Consider whether or not you need to, um, you know, you need to start offering stuff just to move product because in some, you know, for some businesses, this really is a, um, just a matter of, you know, cash flow to keep the doors open. And so, yeah, it's not ideal to sell things at cost or even sometimes below. Um, but if it means getting cash in so that other needs can be met, the business can stay afloat, um, it's time to think about that. So um, we're advising clients again that, that have some sort of e-commerce element. Um, some of those companies are doing good. Um, you know, speaking from experience, I know I've done more online shopping because I don't want to go to a store because I'm, you know, terrified of leaving the house. And so, you know, anybody that has stuff available online um, is getting my business. So if you've got an online presence, you're probably doing okay. But, um, but if you're a combination where you're, you're brick and mortar and online, in order to increase sales, start looking at discounts. Um, if you use influencers, uh, you know, Facebook personalities, Instagram personalities, um, you know, talk to them, try to get them to drive more activity. Um, you know, start talking to your, your, or if you're just starting talking to your supply chain, you're probably a little behind. Um, but start, you know, continue reviewing your supply chain. Look at, you know, what can you do from a payment terms perspective? Um, you know, can you extend some of the stuff out? Um, you know, can you cancel or delay orders? Um, you know, any of that stuff to, again, preserve cash for immediate needs. Um, next slide, Andrew. Um, same thing, you know, banks are gonna work with you. Banks are very interested in, in making sure that, that um, you know, that the company stays in business so they can get, um, you know, they can get, they can get cash from you as well. Um, so, you know, talk to everybody about just delaying payment, delaying terms, all of that stuff. I saw Kevin pop on and I'm seeing my chat window block. So we've hit our time. Um, and I think that's the last slide. Is there one more? Nope, that was it. Um, shameless plug for Moss Adams. Uh, like most businesses, we do have a COVID-19 um, website that we're updating. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's right there in the, in the header. Um, as new stuff comes out or as, you know, new interpretations or new rules come out of, of what has been passed, we're updating that. Um, so please take a look. Um, and with that, one more slide, Andrew, because I think it's our contact stuff. And so again, as questions come up, I'm the uh, I'm the one that in the picture has a beard, um, but uh, due to being stuck at home and not being able to get a haircut, I at least figured I could shave. Um, but that's me on the left, Andrew on the right. Andrew, um, you know, from a, uh, obviously understanding all the technical nuances of the tax law uh, is an awesome resource. Feel free to reach out to either of us. Um, from a timing perspective, um, Stuart, I saw that you had a question on, um, you know, the forgiveness rules related to sole proprietorship. Um, I would encourage you on, on that. It's similar to what Andrew was talking about with the, um, with the PPP. I will have to get in and brush off what, um, what the SE income side of that is. And I can get back to you on that. Um, but from if you're paying wages, all of the forgiveness rules are the same. The only element that I don't want to answer off the cuff because I, I don't have it fresh in my mind is that element of um, really self-employment income and what that means to you. So um, please let me get back to you on that. So uh, if you don't mind, Stuart, just shoot me a quick um, ping. That way I, I have it in my head to get back to you on that because I know we do have some good resources related to the SE side of things. Um, something Andrew and I should have started with, we both live mostly in the C-Corp space. And so admittedly that the self-employed side of things is, is an area where we can get the answers, but have not spent a lot of time actively involved there. So um, I will get that information back to you. And chat is blinking. Um, this is Kevin, David has a question. I don't see a question from David, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, 
Actually, no, I don't see one. Um, so yeah, with that, I will be quiet, turn it back over to, to Kevin Carroll. I know Andrew and I talked fast, covered a lot of stuff, um, but please reach out with any anything we missed or uh, bumbled over. Yeah, I want to uh, I want to thank Kevin and Andrew and um, is it Denny was the dog in the back, uh, Kevin? Uh, Benny. Benny, Benny, I want to thank Benny for uh, being quiet during the meeting. Look, the purpose of these to relay um, a, a large amount of information in a little time, very straightforward, and I think we accomplished that. So a lot of things that I wasn't aware of on the tax side um, and, and just wasn't aware of it. So I want to thank you guys. Um, Moss Adams doesn't pay for this. I grabbed them because uh, they're one of the best uh, best firms around at handling small, mid-sized companies. And I know the team over there. And um, again, this isn't to put in a pitch for Moss Adams, but if you need stuff, uh, you have their contact information, give them a call. Uh, they'll help you out. Uh, they're members of Tech San Diego. So we always appreciate their, uh, their expertise on these items. And we're probably going to have you guys back. I mean, as we go through, I think there's going to be some, uh, some more questions we have. So um, Kevin and Andrew, we may, we may have you back in the, in the near future. Awesome. We'd love to uh, love to be back. All later. right. With that, uh, visit TechSanDiego.org. Uh, this webinar will be recorded. It should be up on our page. We also have a, a COVID-19 uh, resource page. It's uh, updated almost every uh, day. So keep an eye on that. Visit TechSD.org. And we will end this webinar. Thank you for attending. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.